Good evening. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Prabhu Chala has already given us a 30 minute uh, time window, and uh, we will try to do our best with the 30 minutes that's available. Uh, the session is very interesting because the topic uh, covers uh, a wider canvas that extends from K to 12 up to the highest level of education. But having the UGC chairman uh, with us this gathering, we will restrict it to higher education. And let me begin by recalling what Mr. Arun Shuri said 10 years back on the very same platform. And he said, when we have to have reforms, and there has been always this constant requirement of new acts, statutory acts that have to actually make sure reforms happen. And he said he doesn't subscribe to that view and said, more than acts, we need action. And what we have seen in the last five to six years, uh, and uh, in the presence of Professor Anil Sahasrabuddha, I will, I will also acknowledge that as AACT chairman, there were a lot of regulations uh, through which a lot of provisions of the AACT were given power. And we could see in the last two years as the chairman of UGC, there are a lot of enabling provisions in the Statutory Act of UGC, which have been in the form of regulations uh, being put into action. In the last two years, we have seen a lot of UGC regulations that has actually given teeth to the UGC Act. Uh, for want of time, and uh, you'd heard of, uh, you know, uh, multiple choice questions in a similar way. According to you, top three regulations under your leadership as UGC chairman that has transformed the higher education, given the fact that all of this has come after NEP 2020. Vaidya, both of us are teachers. Would you alert some time for questions also? Uh, uh, I question have five questions, session. so each question, five right. minutes, and then I five minutes. I think that will be audience. more interesting if we yeah. can take uh, questions, questions from, from the, the audience. audience. Yeah. But before I answer your question, uh, I would like to set the context. We all remember recently how India conducted itself during its G20 presidency. And there were various issues on which G20 discussed. And education was one of the important topics. And there was a group of education ministers and G20 education working group so they deliberated and the group of education ministers focused on four resolutions. I would like to tell you why it is important for this discussion. So these four resolutions passed by the G20 education ministers, the first one was enhancing the foundational literacy and numeracy among students. And the second resolution was leveraging digital technology in education. And the third one was making education more relevant in the lives of future working uh, force. And the fourth one was enhanced collaboration, cross-border collaboration in higher education, research, and innovation. Yeah. These are the four important themes on which they passed the resolution. Yes. The consensus was arrived yeah. at. And this is central to NEP 2020 also. Exactly. It resonates with NEP 2020 objectives. And then look at the 5C framework formulated by the G20 education uh, group. Um, they focused on the five Cs. The, the first C is you know, capacity and culture, coordination and leadership, content and curriculum, connectivity and infrastructure, cost and sustainability. Again, these resonate with what the NEP 2020 objectives That's are. In other words, at a global level in G20 where 80% of the global population is represented, the resolutions and the frameworks that were passed, they resonate with the objectives of NEP 2020. So therefore, NEP 2020 is not just only relevant to our country, but to a large population across the country. So therefore, it is important that we 
roll out these reforms as quickly as possible True. and empower our students. True. So how will we do that? In order to do that, just before our session, there was a discussion on AI. AI. Do you agree that AI is required in education? Yeah, it is, of, it is. Of course, all it of It is us. a good substitute for a bad teacher. I've <laughs> always been maintaining it. It's a good substitute it. for a bad teacher. But we need to look at other kind of AI in education if you want to bring these reforms. And this is being adventurous and innovative. This is the AI we require, adventurous and innovative. I'll tell you why. You know, if you look at the life of Jagdish Chandra Bose, during his working career until he retired, he worked on wireless communication yep. and radio waves. But after he retired, he switched over to um, biology. And he came up with such results, the entire world recognized his contribution to plant physiology. The university system, for last 70 years or so, we have been rooted in such rigid educational system. It is time now for us to completely come out of that system and take a new path. And that is being adventurous like what J.C. Bose has done. But at the same time, in our university system, when we say we implement these reforms, um, some people say, no, there are infrastructural issues, there are funding issues, and, and so many other reasons will come uh, to the forefront. But again, look at the life of J.C. Bose. When he wanted to take a completely different path, switch from wireless communication to plant physiology, he was very innovative. He designed and built systems, tools, which can recognize very minute changes in the behavior of the plants. That is being innovative. He didn't raise his hands and say, no, nothing can be done. I think it is the responsibility of our education system. Therefore, to come up with innovative solutions to the challenges that we have, be adventurous and implement these reforms. Now, while implementing these reforms, while being innovative, if the educational institutions come up with wonderful ideas, I think as regulators, we need to remain facilitators rather than micromanage um, the institutions. True, true. And that is what UGC is doing. So, so can we take this ABC, multiple entry, exit at different modular levels? These are all the AI, the adventurous, innovative, regulatory solutions as facilitators you're giving to institutions. Sir. You see, the names that you have mentioned, ABC, multi-entry, multi-exit, uh, national credit framework, multidisciplinary education, these are all tools. I think we should not get lost in these tools and lose out on the central Purpose. objective of NEP 2020. The central objective of NEP 2020 is to empower our student to be a lifelong learner. That is the central objective. And these tools help. And in that context, if I had to tell, today, recently I came across a student in one of the meetings with the students. He said, sir, I'm now doing BA economics. Actually, I was doing engineering in my second year because of some family reasons I had to drop out of my education. And I couldn't come back to my engineering program and continue. Correct. Therefore, he started doing BA economics. Now, this is the kind of rigidity that we have in our system. And the other one is that when the student steps out of the educational institution, I'm not saying drops out, uh, takes a brief break. As a society, we look down at those students. We say they are dropouts, they are failures. And it's our responsibility to tell the students through our reforms that education is a lifelong journey. There can be small setbacks for you once in a while, but you will have many opportunities to pick up the threads and move forward. Okay. And this is what we are doing okay. by bringing these reforms. So if you're, if, if you're addressing the rigidity in a system, I'm just taking it the next step. Uh, how will you address rigidity across systems? Example like, you have different statutory bodies, different systems. 
but the flexibility that the NEP 2020 gives, you know, makes you feel that you are part of different systems, which means there should be harmonious coordination between various statutory bodies. For example, UGC, AICT, NCT, and all of these. Mm -hmm. How will you ensure that there is a coordinated effort? Is there any uh, idea that you have in mind that's work in process or certain things that are already working that can enlighten the audience? Sir? I will answer this question in two parts. Now, the reason why Vaidya has asked is, um, this question why you have asked is that because of the multiplicity of the regulators, the stakeholders have challenges. But let me answer it in two parts. If you look at the regulators, who is the biggest regulator in the country? That is UGC. And out of 4.1 crore students, um, nearly 70% of the students are with UGC. And last, the, the vast majority of universities and colleges are with UGC. So even without worrying about the problems or the challenges that we have yes. with the other regulators, within this regulatory system, can we introduce um, reforms so that it will uh, empower our students? For example, I'll tell you how we can do. Let's say as a kid, my family told me or my neighbors or friends told me to take uh, commerce as an example. I pass my 12th standard. Now I get interested to study physics. But when I go and uh, I want to take admission in Vaidya's university, Vaidya will say, no, you have studied commerce. How can I admit you in physics? What we are saying that it is in our hands. If the student demonstrates his or her competency in physics by clearing a national level entrance or it, an entrance uh, conducted by the university, why can't we permit the student to switch the disciplines? And we can bring that kind of multidisciplinary education. And this doesn't require any extra infrastructure. This doesn't require any extra teachers. When we brought out recently the, um, the higher education qualification framework, the undergraduate qualification framework, and the postgraduate qualification framework, we said irrespective of what you have studied in your previous degree or school, you should be able to join in any discipline provided you demonstrate your competency. I would like to ask the educational institutions, are you ready to face this challenge? Are you ready to help our students cross the disciplinary boundaries and become creative and innovative? This is one example yeah, where, suppose I flip which the is example. within our hands and we can do it. Suppose I flip the example and I have a law school student who says, I want to study one subject in engineering and one elsewhere. Given the fact that both the Bar Council or the NMCI are not under the ambit of NEP 2020, what will be the response? Because it's, e it's, it's a, easy to say a science going to engineering because they're part of the system. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is actually in the extra so, jurisdictional space. So that brings us to this second part of the you know, question that you have asked multiple regulatory like regulatory bodies are there. Um, NEP 2020, of course, uh, suggests the establishment of the Higher Education Commission of India, HECI, and a uh, lot of groundwork is being done there in establishing HECI. Once that comes, our hope is that all these regulators will sit across the table and they will come up with uh, common uh, reforms yeah. so that the stakeholders do not have to run from one regulator to the other regulator. Okay. Yeah. This morning before lunch, we had a session on foreign universities. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, three uh, ways by which reforms have happened. One is a classic case of the gift city where the template is completely different. Mm -hmm. And UGC has two regulations. One uh, that promotes twinning, collaborative degree programs and all such. And the second is allowing foreign universities to establish campuses. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the major distinguishing factors between the two, other than the fact that you know, foreign universities can establish their campuses? How can Indian universities become of that type is your first regulation that allows Indian universities to explore collaboration mm -hmm. with uh, uh, foreign universities so that they can also improve the way in which uh, education has been given. Correct. So is there enough uh, ammunition, regulatory ammunition that is available mm -hmm. for Indian universities to exercise that uh, uh, required administrative 
academic and financial autonomy. Of course, IOEs have a different, this. all universities, do they have enough power to exercise that autonomy? So that they can, they can you know, compete with uh, foreign universities if they set up campuses here soon. Right. Um, we all agree that education is not a commodity. And education is a right for all Indians. And we want to make it as affordable as possible. So therefore, our belief is that, and in practice too, our educational institutions are non-profit social organizations. Exactly. That is point one. And point two, um, if foreign universities are encouraged to come and set up campuses here, um, if they are given autonomy in operating their programs, can a similar kind of autonomy can be given to our Indian institutions also. I am a firm believer um, in saying that educational institutions will grow and become outstanding only when a lot of autonomy is given together with accountability. Yeah. Both have to put together. Correct. Now, if you, if you look at the UGC regulations, tell me which regulation stops you from introducing multidisciplinary education to our students, which regulation stops you uh, from recruiting high caliber faculty in our institutions, um, which regulation stops you from starting new programs, which regulation stops you from you know, admitting students in your educational institutions. I think the UGC regulations are very, very broad. Uh, they are not prescriptive. They only provide broader, broader framework for the institutions to innovate within this broader framework. Correct. And broader frameworks are always required to set certain standards for education, right? So I believe that within the existing framework itself, our institutions have a lot of freedom and autonomy, but unfortunately, that autonomy is not being utilized fullest. And that is why I am saying our educational leaders have to be adventurous and innovative. Yeah, but also there is this feeling that this comes with a cost. Mm -hmm. And also on the other side, education being a social infrastructure, right. the imperative is to always reduce the unit cost of education. So on one hand, we have to give multiple choices, uh, give all sorts of uh, uh, opportunities for students, which has high transaction costs. Right. On the other hand, we have the need to reduce the unit cost of education. Mm. So how, what's your advice to higher education institution administrators so that there is a balance between both? I will give you the big, bigger picture and you decide what is the right thing to do. When we sit in a hall like this, often our discussions focus on students who are within this educational system, which is roughly about 4.1 crores. But then there are students which is double and triple this number who are dropping out of the school system, who are dropping out of the college system, and they're all young people. And a large majority of them come from rural background. So, on one hand, we talk about the cost associated with providing high quality education. But on the other side, we have the challenge of taking care of the interests of this large number of youth uh, who will be idling otherwise. Correct. So therefore, as educational institutions, I think it is our responsibility uh, to introduce, for example, technology, leveraging the power of digital technology and take high-quality education to the doorsteps of our students at an affordable cost. And that is how we can empower the students. Okay. Right? The solutions exist, but are our educational ready institutions to ready to utilize these solutions and reach out to the students? Okay. One last question before I open it up for the audience. Uh, Editor Ms. Santana is also here. So maybe if tomorrow... The headlines for this session has to be something, what is next that the UGC is going to come in the form of a new regulation before, <laughs> you know, election mood sets in? What's, what's the new regulation that's just in the pipeline? No, we don't work on creating sensation. We are dealing with the lives of uh, millions of students across the country. Whatever regulation we bring out, whatever guideline we bring out, 
it is done through a consultative process. Uh, it is widely discussed within the UGC system. We consult experts and take their feedback and put it out in the public domain for the stakeholders' feedback, and then we finalize and come out with the... The reason I asked that was the skill, skilling certification is almost there, so will it right. come anytime? The idea is not to create headlines. Sorry, New Indian <laughs> Express, you will not have any headlines. The idea is to transform the lives of our students. Okay. So, transforming lives, if that is the objective, how will the audience want their lives to be transformed? Here is a chance for you to ask the question to the UGC chairman. I wanted to ask about, uh, referring to my previous work with the Gujarat Biotechnology University, which is in partnership with University of Edinburgh. One of the experiences is to match the support given to faculty to be innovative, uh, to have new ideas as an institution, to progress in an impact-driven manner, etc. Uh, how does the UGC see itself supporting the growth of professional services or administration to match up with these new innovations and the new opportunities that the UGC has provided to work in different ways with foreign universities or on their own? Because in my view, there's a lot of focus on how teachers can be different. But I think for an institution to function effectively, the backbone, uh, who we never see, the administration, the professional services, also needs to be uh, different. So your views on that? Absolutely. I think capacity building of teachers also is one of the primary objects, objectives of NEP 2020. There are two ways in which it can be done. One, at the institutional level itself, um, there are so many resources that are available within the country. There are so many experts. Can the institution arrange training programs to our own teachers in order to uh, build their capacities? That is at one level. At the second level, at the national level, UGC has recently announced the establishment of Malavia Mission Teacher Training Centers. We have 111 uh, centers across the country. Our goal is in next three years to train 15 lakh teachers who are working in the higher education system. This is one. We also have to look at the administrative staff because often they are the backbone of the educational institution functioning. Um, we are now going to work with the Capacity Building Commission uh, to check out a training program for the administrative st staff. Many things, uh, such as uh, the competency building, uh, the uh, capacity to use newer technologies, um, interpersonal relations, how do you interact with the stakeholders? So there are many soft skills that need to be imparted to our administrative staff, and we are working on a plan. Um, we should be able to launch this program soon once we finalize the plan. Namaste to all. I am Sudha Trivedi from MOP Vashno College for Women. Uh, sir, my question, when you talk uh, about competency, that means merit, what about the reservation in higher education, sir? Do we compromise with merit? Mm, I think competency and merit are two different uh, things, right? Um, competencies about is, providing competencies is about providing uh, certain skills to the students so that in whatever profession they are planning to work, they become competent. And um, it is our objective that any learner who wants to learn, have access to high quality education, they should get this education um, at their doorstep. That is the idea. So therefore, um, when it is available to everybody, there is no uh, question of somebody who is very meritorious, who is not less meritorious. All that I say that students have different kinds of potentials. To match their potential, can we provide appropriate skills so that their competencies are enhanced and they become more employable? That's the idea. I have a question about why educational institutions um, have more authority in adopting uh, NAP policies and like, is there a chance to include students' preferences on it? Okay, okay, very good. Um, you know, a few months ago, we launched a program called NEP Sardis. Uh, 
Uh, we have selected uh, more than 700 NEP sardis across the country, and I'm very glad to see these NEP sardis uh, working in collaboration with the institutional heads, creating awareness and bringing feedback to the institutional heads so that NEP reforms can be implemented uh, um, at, at a rapid rate. Um, it is important to, to involve the students. They are the important stakeholders in the implementation of NEP 2020. Uh, good evening, I'm Shabari from Shastra University. Deviating slightly from the topic, I would like to ask you about uh, entrance examinations in India. There have been many nations that have uh, if not already gotten rid of, at least have had debates or have tried to get rid of entrance examinations, while India has gone forth and introduced another entrance examination, which is the CUET, mm -hmm. into an already decently long list of entrance examinations in the country. Uh, as a student, uh, my perspective is that entrance examinations create a bit more pressure on students. Uh, so. So it's not deviated, it's very much within the topic, it's a question uh, understood. No, it, yeah. it's not deviation and it's an important question. Thank you for asking this question. Um, apart from JEE and the need for engineering and medical uh, program, there were a large number of other entrance exams in our country and the idea was to replace all those large number of entrance exams and have only one entrance exam. CUET, Common University Entrance Test. And um, will it create further stress? On the other hand, it will reduce the stress because earlier students had to write so many entrance exams conducted by different universities. They had to travel to different cities, um, clash of entrance examinations and so on. But CUET has removed all those kinds of challenges to the students. Number two, in CUET we ensured that the syllabus is confined to the 12th standard. So the students are just fresh. We have written their board exams and they can attempt the CUAT. In fact, if you look at the reactions of the students coming out of the centers flashed on the TV uh, screens, you will see very positive feedback from the students. And um, majority of the students, they do not take any coaching to write CUAT. Um, in my view, CUET has brought a lot of flexibility and more opportunities yeah. for them uh, to choose and join in various kinds of universities across the country. Yep. With this uh, positive uh, hope, uh, thank you very much, sir. It was a pleasure talking to you as always. Thank you very much for enlightening us thank with you. your thank valuable you inputs. Thank you.